And uh, can I please uh, have all our veterans stand this morning? Can you please stand? Let's give a huge, huge thank you. Standing all over the room. Wow, that gave me goosebumps. That was fantastic. You know, we have something very special. We don't, um, we don't often do this, but with every, with every passing year, I think freedom becomes more and more something that we realize it's, it's right there on the edge of, of losing and having and losing and having. And so in honor of that today, we just want to celebrate a little bit of our country. So would you stand with us, please, as uh, Charity has something special for us this morning. I know, I know some of you were tempted to yell, play ball. But really, more appropriate would be go church. And uh, that, uh, that's it. So this country affords us these types of freedoms. So we need to remember that and thank, uh, thank our veterans as moving forward. All right, you may be seated, but at the same time, kids, come on forward. We're going to pray with you this morning. We wanted you to hang out with us for that this morning. So come on down, everybody. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Come on in, everybody. Good morning, sweetie. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you this morning. All right. You got big praying voices in there this morning? You got big praying voices? All right. Church, you got big praying voices? You're going to encourage the kids, and they're going to encourage you. Here we go. Let's pray together. Here we go. Dear Jesus, thank you for this great and awesome country. What a privilege to grow up here. And thank you for this church and everyone in it. And may we do everything you've called us to do. So bless the rest of this time and this day. And everybody said, All right, boys and girls, off you go this morning. Off you go, off you go, off you go. All right, there they go. There they go this morning. Just give them another half second. Thank you. All right. Uh, if you're our guest today, we just want to say a very special good morning. Thanks for being with us. And, uh, in your, in your uh, chair in front of you, you'll see this card that says Connection and uh, also says Welcome to SJAG. And uh, that's us, Sandy Central Assembly of God. And if you'd be so kind just to take a moment, fill out the information. 
that is there. We promise we're not going to inundate you with phone calls and showing up your house and everything else. But we just want to uh, we want to connect with you as best as we can. And so if you would take a moment to fill out that information, and if you'd let us know if this is your first or second time. And also, um, we're getting to that time of the year where we start thinking about uh, year end, and we send out uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of giving receipts. And we want to make sure that uh, those of you that have been giving this year get your receipt from us. And so if you would do us a favor as well, if you would just make sure uh, we, well, the reason this is, we're mentioning this is last year we had so many come back to us undeliverable, all right? Wrong addresses and everything else. And we knew you were here, but the address wasn't correct. And so if you would just take a moment and just f fill out the front of that card really legibly, we'll cross-reference it with the records we have. And we'll make sure when it comes that time of year, is sometime near the end of January, uh, we have uh, these going out to the right places. And so we'll collect these in just a moment along with our tithe and offering. And I want to share with you a, um, an email that I received about 10 days ago. And what encouraged me about the, the email is that um, they were fondly remembering something that we talked about about 12, 14 months ago. Now, that does a pastor good when people actually remember something that he said 14 months ago. Because most of us, studies say, will forget within 30 minutes of leaving here today what we talked about. That's what the studies say. And so um, I want to read this letter. A year ago, when you were teaching on tithing, I was struggling financially, but wanted to so badly to get back to tithing to honor God. I just didn't know how I could possibly do it. And this is the most common thing. I just don't know how I can do this. I would say I, w I was struggling, and you'll see why in a moment. Somehow, each month, God got me through. The final sermon you taught, you said, I challenge you to take a step forward in faith and tithe. Let me tell you that this was a huge step forward in faith to tithe, and, to, and, and here's why. As I said earlier, somehow God got me through each month. Each month. Every payday, I was in the red, or I was behind by 50 to $60. But by his grace, I was able to pay every bill and credit card on time every month. And if it hadn't been for coworkers sharing their lunch with me, or my folks having me over for dinner, or my daughter's father sending my daughter uh, home each evening with a full belly and a care package for me, we would not have eaten. Toward the end, I would, I would use my credit card for gas and buy six cans of soup for my daughter's lunches. She would get half a can of soup for lunch each day at preschool and crackers, etc. All these people helped me, and I believe, by, by God moving in their lives. I wasn't one to complain that I didn't have money or food or this or that or the other. People just gave when I needed them most. Money was tight, but I never felt broke or without. Here's the rest of the story. So you challenged us to tithe, not just the net, but the gross income. You know, I read that and I think, man, what a mean pastor I am, right? But no, this, this is right. This is important. I thought, God, this is your money. You can do anything. Please know the only extra I had was a cell phone, which was my only source of communication, and it wasn't even a smartphone. I didn't know they even made non-smartphones anymore, right? There's not many of those. No cable TV, no internet, just bare bones. But you know what? We were happy. So I stepped out in faith and made that 10% tithe on the gross of my paycheck. Talk about scary. So what happened next? My boss decided out of the blue to give me a raise. And a company cell phone, a smartphone, no less. Then the house uh, we were trying to sell uh, miraculously sold, and it opened up the ability for me to get out of debt. So this is the note, and she's not writing to me, but she wanted to encourage you with this morning. Uh, to our congregation, I want to encourage people to tithe if they're feeling that, that tug on their heart. Yes, he wants us all to tithe, but he also wants us to be a cheerful giver. That's why I say if you have that tug on your heart like I did, um, then your heart is in the right place to move forward. If God can do what he did for me, he can do it for you too. Remember, he is the giver of faith, too. He will give you the faith it takes to make that step forward. Folks, I just know that sometimes it's an absolute struggle. But when I read stories like this, and I've, I've had these experiences in my own life, and I've heard the experiences back to me from others, folks, God has a way. And so as we move in faith today, I want to encourage you to uh, just take that step and move forward. We're, 
Um, I think I mentioned to you last week, but we hit a crazy patch for about five or six weeks that got us actually behind. We haven't been behind in about 13 months, but in the last five or six weeks, it's just kind of done a flip on us, and I uh, can't necessarily explain why. Um, can't blame it on the election. Thank God that's over, right? And, uh, and all those other things, but um, so we're, we're sitting in, a, in an odd spot as well today, and so your ongoing faithfulness, uh, we're just trusting God for a miracle as we trust God for miracles in your life as well. So if you're at the end of the row, if you'd reach down, grab a bucket, and let's pray together, and then we'll receive our morning tithe and offering. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for every dollar and every dime. It all matters. It matters to you, Lord. And Lord, it's, it's that condition of the heart. It's that, it's that willingness to step out in faith. It's that, that's the ability to trust you even when whew, we don't know how it's all going to come together. But God, I thank you for a strong testimony this morning of your provision. And Lord, I pray that testimony would be repeated all over this congregation. That Lord, we can believe you. You are that type of loving Heavenly Father and you make a way. So Lord, some are worried about how it's going to go in their business. And they're concerned today about those things. And others are, are concerned about uh, how the household finances are going to come together. And I pray, Lord, that we would learn to say, God, you've got this. And I'm going to be faithful and move forward in that which you've called me to do. So we ask this. We pray your blessing on it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may pass that along the aisle, and there'll be an usher there to, uh, to pick that up. And as that's coming, we've got a very special video for you. Good morning, family. So excited to see you all here today. My name is Shirley Bowman, and I had the pleasure of meeting many of you as you walked in this morning, and it was one of my favorite things to do. Some of you gave me your names, and I'll need to get them a couple times before they get in here, but my name's Shirley, so don't forget mine. <laughs> I was thinking of the song this morning, we are family, I've got all my sisters with me, yeah, brothers and sisters with me, and a uh, fun song, and, but it's neat to think of family. I woke up this morning thinking of this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice, we will rejoice, and be glad in it. Amen. And it's a wonderful day to come together because we can have corporate fellowship, unity, fellowship. We can have corporate worship. We sang together, and how awesome is that? And the Lord is blessed, and he blesses us because of that. And we can have corporate giving. You know how much fun it is to give when you're together. I've given online before, just not the same. Yes, I do it because I didn't want to miss or whatever. But to be here, to put that offering in together and knowing that we're doing it in unity, that God blesses that. And I'm so amazed by that. I also thought, wanted you to think of, have you ever thought of a moment when you've closed your eyes and just wondered what God's face looks like? Whatever conjured up in your mind, if you think of the verse that says that he rejoices over us with singing and see a singing face, smiling face, or that his banner over us is love and see that love. Or in Numbers, it says in the Aaronic blessing, it says that the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. Remember that? His shining, loving, smiling, singing face. Do you see that face when he thinks of you? Amazing God that we have. And learn to, to read his word and see what he looks like when he's looking at you. What an extravagant love our God has for us. The theme for Evening of Elegance this year is extravagant love. That's just a little taste of what you will be receiving, ladies, when you, want, when you come in. And this place is transformed into multiple tables that are decked out in beautiful china. And everyone's, well, my closet was calling me this morning. And everyone has to pick a dress that's saying, pick me, pick me, pick me.
this is one of them. But I have like three others from different weddings, and, and I'm like, oh, which one? And they're going, please, please let me out of the closet. This one's, I think, been about six years since it's been out of the closet, so maybe this year. And so please sign up today. This is the last day for ladies for you to sign up to get the cheapest price of the ticket. We have a new caterer this year, and we had the privilege of having a taste test of four different entrees, and oh my goodness, it was unanimous on what we picked. You're going to be excited, but that caterer is going to need a head count. That's why we're pushing you to sign up for your tickets and giving you that extra special deal today that ends today. But please sign up. And men, those that have served before, please sign up at the gazebo today. Also, I'm saying please too much. Sign up at the gazebo today with your name and your number so we can call you. You get a flyer that tells you everything you need to know, guys about that night on when to be here or how to be dressed and all that. It's going to be fun. And most of all, the Lord is going to bless it because it's corporate fellowship again and a wonderful time to be together. We also have uh, donated turkey to a needy family this year. So if you're going and getting ready for your Thanksgiving, which is only coming up in a couple weeks, and you're buying your turkey, buy a second one so you can bring it to church in weeks I think it's two weeks you got to have your turkey here on the 23rd frozen um, we don't want it to get rotten or anything um, and then if you are participating in stuff the bag all these beautiful bags are on each side of the uh, what's this called stage and you want to bring non perishable items and fill your bag up you, you know you got stuff in your in your kitchen that you want to maybe clean out for some new stuff maybe or or if you're buying all your fixings for Thanksgiving buy two so that you can fill this bag then you're gonna take this bag and is it next Sunday next Sunday the 16th you're gonna leave this behind your car that is trusting that no one's gonna back up over it so someone's going out there and gathering all these bags so you don't have to carry it and lug it all the way in here if it's really heavy you're going to leave it behind your car and wonderful people are going to come pick them up what a blessing you can do for other people then if you need a turkey maybe you just need a turkey this year then you need to mark your connection card and be sure to fill it out completely with your name and information and put on there need a turkey and we'll make sure that um, gets to you and last but not least next Friday is November the 14th and it is laugh life after 50 and they are having their harvest banquet they put on a beautiful dinner for you and a beautiful entertainment and the team works so hard so ladies and gentlemen this is for both of you life after 50 and that includes me um, Sign up at the gazebo today and be excited. Lord bless you. Remember, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will. We will what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Thanks. Thanks, Cheryl. Never had anyone bring a dress to the announcements before. Brand new. The, um, uh, this Thursday night, we, uh, from 6 o'clock, we'll be gathering for, 6.30, we'll be gathering for prayer for an hour and a half. Now, I know for some of you, the idea of praying for an hour and a half is absolutely terrifying. Uh, because you go, I just, I, I can't do that. Uh, our format is such as that uh, we have stations all over the room. And not only does that help uh, increase your ability to pray and pray a little bit longer than you normally would, but also allows, there's a lot of movement going on, so if you can only come and stay a few minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and then you need to slip out, then we want to give you that, that ability to do so without embarrassment. But folks, we absolutely need to pray. And we're in a very interesting season. We're now through the election time, and we're heading into uh, the holidays and everything else. And um, we just, uh, we, we'd set this date back four or five weeks ago just as a key date. And so I am encouraging you. And if you've never been to a prayer meeting before, then you need to come to a prayer meeting. But uh, come join us this week. I'm excited that our Spanish congregation will be joining us as well. And so hopefully we'll see you out. And if you're getting here late, that's okay. Just come and uh, join us for, for a time of prayer. It's absolutely essential. And then finally, I know a million death by announcement this morning. 
uh, we have, uh, we're packing the shoe boxes next week, which is very exciting. But in those shoe boxes, the one item that we're absolutely short of today are uh, just the, the inexpensive toys. And uh, uh, the, we, we've done well in all the other areas, but if you wanted this week, just kind of help us bring a few extra toys that we can place in there, that would be great. All right, have a very special video for you. Here it is. I give to God by enjoying what he has given me. Okay? I mean, do you really think he expects something back? Now, I know there's a lot of people at church that would not understand this line of reasoning. That's why, just to make things simple and not to cause any controversy, I like to carry what I call the little empty envelope, all right? You see, when the plate gets passed, I bloop, put it in there like that. The deacon's counting the money. They only know me as the crazy empty envelope guy, but the people sitting around me, clueless. <laughs> I win, they win, God wins. No one gets hurt because no one knows. God knows. Huh? Let me ask you a question, huh? How's your mutual fund? Hey, for that matter, how's all your funds? Ha has the fund left your funds, huh? Has your dole me taken a W-A-L-K, huh? <laughs> what if I told you that I knew about an investment you could make that the return would be mind-boggling? And, 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 it's, and it's promised, it's guaranteed. I know what you're saying, there's no guarantees. This one's guaranteed, okay? Malachi 3.10, so it says in the Old Testament, it says, test me, give to God, and he will give you back. It goes like this, I give this, he gives this. I give this, he gives this. I give this, up right up there. He keeps giving, I can't outgive God. How crazy is that? <laughs> Do I love him? Sure, whatever. I'm just saying, if you give, he gives back. <laughs> I tithe. But just not like in the form of a 10% check per se. Let me tell you what I mean. When I go to church on a Sunday morning, they're selling donuts. I buy some. Boom. That's a tithe. When my whole Sunday school class wants donuts and I, out of the goodness of my heart, buy a whole bunch for the Sunday school class, boom. That's another tithe. But it's not about me spending money. It's about the smile on people's faces. That, my friends, is tithe enough for me. Case in point, the church was having date nights where we could take our spouse out for an evening, and they were charging $25 for child care. Boom shakalaka tithe. But I'll tell you what the biggest tithe was. When I spent over $100 on our meal, and my wife was grinning ear to ear, that, my friend's a tithe. I, w I would like to give. I would, okay? But everything right now is just... Crazy. I mean, just crazy, you know? I mean, not normal crazy, really crazy, you know? And if after I paid my bills and took care of the things that I need and want, then I would, I would consider giving something, but not, now it's crazy. We're, we're, we're going to give later. We've already talked about it. I mean, down the road, we'll be crazy givers, but right now, it's just crazy. Yeah, I have money, that's a fact. But you know what, it's a hard thing between me and the Lord and the pastor because he needs to know what I'm giving now that we have this little building campaign going on, if you know what I'm saying. And pastor, I'd give a little bit more. I'd give a little something, something if you'd have that music minister sing a couple more hymns now and then, huh? Hey, what's this, what's this? Is that a Benjamin? I think it is. Benji likes hymns. Come on, you want it? Ah, come on, pastor, do what I say, huh? Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> oh, in my life, Lord, be glorified in me. I put money in the plate. Wait, wait, wait. Look what I have here. I hope it doesn't interfere. That everyone can hear how I give with cheer That everyone could be like me Jazz hands. fun, huh? You know, it, it, it is fun. And, and that's what we have to get into our head. Uh, we, we have to get beyond uh, some of the games that we play. Uh, Chip Ingram, who wrote the book Genius of Generosity, where we're grabbing some of this, tells the story of when he was in between college and seminary, and he had, he had this opportunity to, um, 
uh, you know, teach and, and everything else, and, and they were doing okay, and they were, they were making about a thousand bucks a month at that time, and, and he decided that he was going to give 20% because he was very spiritual, so he was going to give 20%, and then somewhere along the way, he decided that he was going to give 30% to tithe, and, 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 but what Chip was doing was, and, and he says this now, that he felt kind of pious about it. In other words, he started to feel like, you know, because he would kind of drop it with people a little bit, and I said, yeah, you know, 10% is great, but, you know, I do a little bit more, you know, and, you know, it's, we, we do more than 20, and, and he was kind of talking about this, and, and so it, it's, it's just funny how the Lord sometimes works in those situations and has a way of working it out and continuing to teach us. They were going to go off, like I said, to go off to seminary, and in the current time he was working a teaching job in the Texas area, and, and as he was driving his little VW bug, he was uh, on his way to work, and, and he felt like the Lord was talking to him, and he said, hey, Chip, tell me about your car. Oh, this? Well, you know, we're going to go off to seminary, and it's probably worth about $1,000. We're going to sell it, and, and uh, we're going to use that towards school and everything else. He says, hey, you know, that's, that's good. How about you give it to Nancy? She's going to the mission field. And she needs a reliable car to, to drive to visit pastors and churches and everything else. And why don't you do that? And, and he's like, well... I really could use the money for school and everything else. And folks, I got to tell you, when God begins to get into these with you and you begin to have these excuses or things going, just, I'm just going to tell you right, right now, you just want to stop. Because God always wins these. It's just the way it goes, all right? And, and the longer you delay, it seems like it go, it's going to cost you more, frankly. That's what I've learned in life. And so anyways, uh, he's like, you want me to give this away? He said, yes, you, you, you said this is mine, right? He said, yeah, yeah, everything's yours, Lord, that's right. And, and you do tithe a whole lot, so you have no problem. So the Lord was beginning to remind him. He went home, told his wife, and she was really great about it, and he went out to the garage, immediately started to remove the $400 stereo from the car, and she came out and said, what are you doing? He goes, well, this is where they said, he said to ask for the whole car. This is a part of the car. It's going to. And so she was right, of course, and, and, and he sent that off, and he, and he gave that to, to the missionary. And, and, and the whole thing of it was, you know, that, that he learned a lesson that everything belonged to God. And, and that number that he put out was something that he kind of made up to make himself feel good. But really, it's about that God is the owner of everything. Now, we love the word generous or generosity. It gives us great mental pictures and, of giving and receiving. And, of course, as we move into the holiday season, that's, uh, that's what many experience. But the other word, which is equally important for us to understand today, is a much more boring word. It's the word steward or stewardship. But unfortunately for most of us, we have a kind of a wrong view of stewardship, and we think of stewardship only as an obligation. And the reason that is, is that we have a very narrow view. Biblical stewardship, though, is really a, is a, is a fantastic thing. It's a beautiful thing. When we understand properly, it is something that flows from the right understanding that God truly owns everything. And we're simply trustees of what God allows us to maintain possession of for a short period of time. Now, many years ago, Don and I did this class called Crown Ministries, and the very first uh, exercise that we did was we, 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 we took this sheet and we filled out everything that we owned, and we were to write it down, and I knew where this was going because it was called a quick claim deed, and what it meant at the end, I was going to sign off and say, this is all to you, Lord. But I was, you know, I was kind of waffling a little bit with this God's ownership of everything, and I thought, if I don't write it down then maybe I can sign off on a lot of this stuff. No problem. You can have it. But some of those things I was really reluctant to, to put down because of that. No, I've worked hard for that. That's mine, and I, I, I don't want to do my life without that. See, genuine stewardship by nature is generous because it points us towards God's purposes and priorities that always helps and always moves and forwards his, his gospel, and it is a kingdom uh, mentality that allows us to see a much bigger thing. If we want to proper, properly understand generosity, then we need to see it through the lens, the real lens of stewardship today. This is something that we don't do out of reluctant obligation, but it's the beginning of, a, of an adventure, and the beginning of something that truly is an opportunity. But in order for this to engage in the genius of generosity principle, we need to take what we know here and get it here, get it into our heart, get it into our lives. 
You see, let me, let me just throw these things out for, for understanding. And this is the basis from which I build this this morning. God owns everything. Now, some of you are going, well, I don't know. No, God owns everything. We are just the trustees. And God has a purpose for the resources that he's put in our care for us to manage. Now, when this happens, when we understand that he owns everything, it does take the pressure off. So much so that I've heard people say, hey, someone dented your car today, Lord. I hope you can get that fixed. And, and so I, I've heard people get to that place where they're just, there's the stress on things isn't, isn't so heavy anymore. And when stuff happens, they, they, they just say, God, it's yours. We move from rules to adventure. We, we walk in a new journey of faith. We wake up every day and, and we look at the things that are around us and we not only can thank God for his blessing, but we also recognize that perhaps God wants to use some of those things that he's put into our care for a blessing for the kingdom for other people to benefit from. We all are stewards of God's resources. Now, we have a fantastic picture of this out of the Old Testament. My, my favorite uh, character of scripture is Joseph. There are so many storylines that come out of the life, uh, life of Joseph. And as you know, Joseph was, was uh, roughed up by his brothers, uh, thrown into a well, then later slo- uh, sold into slavery. And he ends up in the household of, a, of an Egyptian official by the name of Potiphar. And Potiphar saw something in Joseph that uh, was truly uh, remarkable, so much so that that Potiphar turned over all the household responsibilities, the property management, the housework, the finances, the the laborers, and the cultivation of the land. All that came now under the care of Joseph. Joseph was put in charge of everything and was given, listen to this, was given the power of attorney over everything that Potter owned. And Joseph ran the, the business affairs, kept good accounts, and reported to his boss. And that's exactly what God does with us. He gives us power of attorney over everything that belongs to him. And we are responsible to God uh, over all the things he allows us to manage. Now consider, this idea doesn't just apply to finances. And this is where we often get hung up. But it applies to so many aspects, really to everything of our life. In regards to time, uh, Psalm 90, 12 so, uh, says this, Teach us the number our days a right that we may gain a heart of wisdom in regards to our spouse and i like to say there's no give backs but it says proverbs 19 uh, 14 says houses and wealth are inherited from parents but a prudent a prudent wife is from the lord one amen on that one come on guys come on gentlemen dude you're married less than a month that i don't get an e- a- amen from you thank you my goodness luke you know what his problem was? He was too busy. He was snuggling up here on the front. I was watching him. He's like, oh, baby, your hair smells so good. So good. Maybe Jeff will finish sooner today. We can get All right. All right. If you're going to sit in the front row, you're a target. All right. There we go. Our property says that belongs to the Lord, says this out of Luke 16, 12. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? It doesn't end there. You see, God has a claim on all, every aspect of our life. Our spiritual gifts, Romans 12, 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. God's truth, and I love this one. So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and those that are entrusted with the secret things of God. I love that verse, the secret things of God. Why is that? Because God, by his Holy Spirit, enlightens us to know his truth in a powerful way. And to the world, it seems foolish, but it's the secret things of God that now give us life. It's amazing. And of course, our body, it says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, you ha- whom you have received from God. It says right here, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, God, honor God with your body. My goodness. So here's the big question this morning that I want you to think about as we move forward in this Genius of Generosity service, uh, s- series. It's this. 
Can God trust me? Can God trust me? Out of Luke chapter 16, and if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you're using your smartphones this morning, Bible Gateway or version are excellent versions uh, in regards to having all that available to you. I'm reading out of the NIV, but you may choose to read out of your uh, favorite version this morning. But Luke 16, this is one of the more provocative uh, of, of um, parables. It's, it's greatly misunderstood. Many people read this and go, huh? What does that mean? I don't understand. And uh, so let's, let's look at this and, and get a little bit of backstory before I read the first nine verses of this for you this morning. The main character of this story was a man that was dishonest with his master's money, okay? He was actually lazy with his master's things. The audience for his teaching was not only his disciples, but was directed also to the Pharisees who were, who were always scrutinizing what Jesus was saying and was looking to find fault in his teaching. Now, through the years, uh, giving and generosity has always been understood and taught uh, from Scripture. And we see here at the beginning of, the, uh, uh, of this scene that Jesus is relaying the story to the Pharisees for this reason. They had gone about getting rich, but they had gone about it in a dishonest way. You see, their justification was this. If people see that the, 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 the spiritual leaders are wealthy then they will recognize that God is a, a God of provision. But they, their, their, their justification was that they could do anything to get there and, and then just display to people, well, God has blessed us. And, and Jesus wanted to make sure that they were called out that any corrupt manager um, <laughs> is, not, is not the way to go about showing God's, God's blessing. So let's begin reading here. At verse number one, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Sounds like he's getting the pink slip here, right? The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. If I'm, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. Next verse, please. Or, that's okay. There we go. Thank you. So as we, this natural break in this, we see that he's losing his job. He's, he's not strong enough to, to do manual labor. He doesn't want to beg. He's had this place of position. Obviously, he's working in, a, in, uh, in, in, in someone's home that has some notoriety, some wealth and everything else. And so his idea of going to beg. And so he begins to look at another option. And this is where we find us in verse number five. And it says, so he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe the master. 800 gallons of olive oil. It's a lot of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. So what is the guy doing? Well, the guy is going, and he realizes that he's been lazy. He's not handled his, his master's accounts very well. But now he's desperate, and he realizes that he probably has very few friends in this world and not many opportunities for employment. So he's going to go out and make friends with the very people that are in debt to his master. And if he can find favor with them, okay, then perhaps when he loses his job, which is an inevitability, they will hire him. Now, why they would want to hire them if they know he's lazy, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is he gives them a significant discount. One of them he gives 50% discount. Another he gives a 20% or something like that discount. He gives a very significant discount to that individual. And why is he doing this? Well, he realizes that he needs to do something. He needs to, to be looking forward as to how he is going to survive going forward. Verse number 8 says, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than they are people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. And this is the verse that people absolutely get hung up on. To gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. 
See, there's a surprise in this story that the rich man found out that the manager had done, and he commended him for his actions. He commended him for his wisdom. He commended him for taking that momentary problem and making a, 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 a great solution out of it. Now, sometimes we think, how could he possibly be happy if he was only getting a discount on his money? Well, when we understand the story a little bit further, it, it, there, there's, there's an allusion to the fact that, that the, the, the guy who was the dishonest or the lazy man was using his own money to cover the other part of the bill, you see. And so that being said, the, 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 the rich man wasn't out anything and got all his money that was owed him, and then he got rid of someone that he didn't want to work for him anymore, but now this man had found favor. Very interesting story, and, and this man did it by leverage. And this is how Jesus applied this teaching to us. We ought to use, and this is where people go, oh, man, this is too much of the, you know, the real world, the spiritual world, and I don't know if we can really combine it. But, folks, that's how we live our lives every day. Then he says this, we ought to use worldly wealth to gain friends for ourselves so that when it's gone, we will be welcomed into eternal blessings. Now, don't, don't shut me down yet. See, the dishonest manager leveraged what he had in the present in order to gain a future reward. And Jesus said, this is what the disciples ought to do with their worldly wealth. Not so much that it would provide provision for them, but that they would be laying up treasure, which also in this case remains souls. They would be laying up people that would come to the knowledge of the saving uh, grace of Jesus Christ and that they would be able to come alongside and that would be their treasure, their reward. We ought to use our material resources here and now with a view toward getting a future reward in heaven with God. And that's what the story is saying. And some people go, I don't like it. And I have to say, why? Why don't you like it? That's God's promise. That's not my promise for you. I just get to be the one who gets to bear the good news for you. Now, what you do with that is up to you. But I see a principle here of leverage. I see something that God says that, that, he, he, that the, in regards to the, the manager, uh, he was shrewd. And the, the resources that God gives to us, if they're truly God's, and we're truly accepting of that of our life, that everything belongs to the Lord, then God wants to use what you have for kingdom purposes. Now, that changes things, doesn't it? See, Jesus went on to say this in chapter 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little also be dishonest with much. So the context immediately is money, but it goes a lot farther than that. If we are faithful with small things, we will be entrusted with greater things. And if we can't handle something as mundane as money or wealth, then, then how will God be able to bless us uh, with spiritual and eternal things. In other words, it is just foundational that we understand that everything belongs to the Lord. Now, probably this is one of the hardest lessons in the West that we have to learn. Because, comparatively speaking, we have more than everybody else. And there's a privilege with and a blessing in that, but there's also a responsibility that comes with having. And so in other parts of the world where they have very little, they have no trouble believing that everything belongs to the Lord because they don't have much. So they gladly and willingly say, Lord, it is all yours. Make a way in my life. But if we step into this idea that God is, well, God, is, God owns everything. He knows your gifts. He gives those to you. He provides the relationships in your life. He provides the opportunities. He says that your body is not even your own. If we really believe these things, then he provides opportunities, little tests for us, where we can be challenged in this. It's like this. He says, okay, let's see where your heart is. Are you really worshiping me, or are you worshiping yourself through your stuff? See, Jesus makes it very clear that the true test of devotion is what we do with this little thing called money in our lives. And there are basic principles, two basic principles that can establish, uh, that should be established in our life that show that God is our priority. And that's what I'm getting at this morning. 
that God is our priority. And these prerequisites uh, are essential in order to become generous. The first is that faithful stewards demonstrate generosity by giving their first and their best to God. You've heard this before. Proverbs 3.9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Now certainly at this time of the writing, agriculture was a part of the economy. And agriculture is still a part of our economy today, but we're not a barter and trade economy like we were at this time. So that does not negate the fact that this is still a, a true principle for us today. The point is, our priorities need to be right. Then our offerings to God will come first, right off the top of our income. Now, this is hard for us because oftentimes we come to what we need to do for the Lord last, and we kind of hope that there's something left. Right? Isn't that what we do? Isn't that how that, that kind of happens in our life as we live? But the Old Testament gives us several principles of, of, of giving first. And the harvest offering was a gift uh, uh, to God of the first fruits. But oftentimes we treat tithe kind of like the way we do when we, we clean out our garage. See, we, 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 we go into the garage and, and we go, oh, I can't even park a car in here anymore. And, and, and you go, okay, I'm going to get rid of stuff. And then you go, what am I going to do with stuff? Well, I'm going to have a garage sale. And then you, you get rid of a few things, and, and you get a little bit of income from that. But then you don't want to put it back in the garage, so you do what? You take it to Goodwill, and you get a tax receipt. And yes, that may sound generous, and it is, but the fact of the matter is, when we relate that to the things of God, when we always treat God as the last, what we do last with those things, you see how it's very kind of secondish. It's not very intentional. It is really more about an afterthought with the hope that there will be something left. And this is what Paul talks about. And it's the second step to generosity that reflects that, that God is our, our priority in giving when we do so systematically. Now, many of us don't like that idea of systematic giving because we, we'd say, well, I just, I just give when the Lord speaks to me. Well, I'm thrilled about that. I absolutely are. And and I like to think of myself as someone that responds in giving that way as well. And, um, you know, there are many a service or many an opportunity that, I, that I, I show up at, and I have no intention of cracking open my wallet. But as I'm sitting there, I feel the Holy Spirit speak to me. And all of a sudden, you know, and that's always the day that I don't have a five in my wallet, by the way. Right? It's always the day that I went to the ATM, and the ATM only gives you 20s. So it always starts there, right? That's how, it, that's how it goes. So I absolutely believe that the, the Spirit prompts us to give, but I also believe what Paul is speaking of in 1 Corinthians, that there should, be a, there should be a method to our giving, and that divine inspiration is what moves things forward, but there is also the necessity of regular giving so that, so that ministry can continue to move forward in that which has been promised. See, true generosity is first and foremost a pattern of giving. So Paul urged the church in Corinth to do what the church in Galatia was practicing. And here's the verse. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. See, this is just a small verse in a larger context, but it just points to here's how you can do this. Just set a little bit aside at the beginning of the week. In other words, be intentional. And we talk about first fruits and we, we think about tithe, and certainly that is in, in relation to, to this. But the point I want to get at is that there is a very much a habit in regards to giving, and there's very much a habit that needs to be experienced and exercised in order for us to understand the genius of generosity. So I asked you the question can God trust you? And the key is to recognize is that generous givers understand God's purposes and make it their highest priority. So are you living in God's highest priority? So here's three things I want you to ask yourself as we come to conclusion this morning. Number one, am I using money entrusted to me in, in, in accordance with God's or the owner's wishes? Have you ever thought of it that way? If God owns it all, then am I spending it wisely? Certainly a quick inventory of your checking account, your bank statements, 
and all the like, looking at any kind of financial pro profile, is to understand whether or not that uh, you have a clear direction in understanding his purposes or not. Whose agenda are you truly fulfilling? Now, some of you are going, hey, 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 wait a second. We've got to put food on the table. Absolutely. And, you know, we need, we need a roof. Absolutely. And all those things. But oftentimes, our own agenda always supplants God's agenda. And we've got to get to the place where we recognize there has to be a balance. Whose priorities are we living? And the same is true, again, in regards to every one of those things we talked about that God has ownership of, which is everything. So are we maximizing that which God has given us in order to do that which he's called us kingdom lives? Of course, when we look closely, we see our money goes to basic needs, and it has to happen. You, you have need of food. And, and, and you know, out of Matthew um, chapter 6, it's one of the most beautiful pictures that God says that, you know, you've got the flowers and the birds of the air. Look how God clothes the flowers and how he takes care of the birds of the air. But how much more valuable to, uh, to him uh, are, are you and so God puts value on you in a powerful way and because of that then he knows that which you have need of and Matthew six thirty three says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness again the first fruits principle and then all these other things will be given to you as well but the thing we have to learn and it's taken me a long time to learn this as well and maybe you're way way farther down the road on this than I am but we also need to enjoy life and when we begin to really live within his priorities, then I believe that God makes a way for us to be able to enjoy those blessings. And again, we can continue to be a blessing to others. You see, when I become a good manager, when I become someone that absolutely appreciates that it is all God's, then I have a deeper concern and I have a deeper value for the resources that get directed into my life. Secondly... Am I carefully keeping an account of not just the 10%, but of the 90%? You see, you can faithfully give your 10, but if you're, if you're just crazy with what you have left, then folks, I want to caution you that um, you're just digging yourself a hole. Because again, it's about stewardship. It's impossible to be good stewards of God's money entrusted, uh, entrusted to us if we are not using it for kingdom priorities. And again, I'm not talking about you can't have things, but I'm telling you that we need to live kingdom first. And this means for some of you, you have to establish the dreaded B, the budget. You have to understand that a budget is necessary in order to move forward. Now, if you are in a relationship, this is, this is, a, this is a tougher challenge. Because oftentimes I find that when you're in a relationship, usually you're in an opposite of tracks type of scenario. And one of you will be good with money, and one of you will not. Does that describe any couples in this room today? All right, just let's see your hand. Let's go ahead. Yeah, I know, I know some of you. That's right. Then I recognize this is what happens. And so the challenge in this is that we need to have some sort of an understanding, and there needs to be excellent communication. And we need to, we need to remember that um, it all matters. A number of years ago, same class, Crown Ministers. It's such a huge impact in my life, and there's a, there's a challenge in that, in that series that says, write down everything that you spend for a whole month, okay? A whole month. And you know what that does? It gives you a really good picture where you spend your money. But I had really, I mean, I'd done that quick claim thing, and I said, okay, God, really is all yours? So I started to write down everything I spent. Now, this is pre-cell phone, so this is a long time. You've got to remember, I'm pretty old. And uh, that was for you, Wanda. But this is pre-cell pre phone days, and I had to use a pay phone. I think about pay phones now, and I just can't think about how dirty those things must be and everything else. Like, pick that up with two fingers and hold it about here and talk into it, right, you know? Um, but I had to put a dime into the phone to make it work. When I got home that day, you know what I did? I wrote it down. I recorded the expense. Donna's looking at that at the end of the month together. She goes, a dime? And I went, yeah, a dime. She goes, a dime. I said, yeah, a dime. It matters to God. Do you know I cannot walk by a penny on the ground today? 
I, I look, I, and I, without shame, I bend down, pick it up. I don't get down real gracefully, but I get down and I pick it up. And I go, Lord, this doesn't mean a lot, but I'm going to be faithful with it. Right? And, and I just learned this lesson, and, and it, as couples, if you can learn this lesson together that we, we, we get to be faithful with everything, every part of it. But God isn't this cosmic killjoy. You see, the thing I, I learned is that as I become best friends of the owner by managing his resources, then he trusts me with other things. And as he trusts me with other things, he then actually blesses me. And every now and again, he blesses me in such a way that I can actually do something fun with that which he has provided for me. Now, that took me years to comprehend because I was always like, oh, I was just this maniacal saver. Just every extra dollar came in. It went there, it went there. So I was always living like with this tension going, I can't spend it. I can't spend it. I can't spend it. But it was really even in the series last year, the Blessed Life series where I just stood back for a moment and went, wait a second. I've been, I've been just kind of been way too wound up and stressed about this and making this all about me, and it's not. God's not stressed about my finances, but I seem to be. Well, I want to live more like the way he thinks about my finances, and so I'm not going to be stressed about it the same way. I'm going to line up my priorities with his priorities. I will do kingdom good. And if there's anything left over after all that is necess you know, necessary for my family, God speaks about taking care of your family and all those things and even extended family. It's not good if, uh, if we, we do not share and all that kind of stuff. And when I take care of all my responsibilities, if there's something left over, then use it. Use it in such a way, but use it, perhaps even use it in a way that leverages souls for the kingdom. You see, be a blessing in such a way. You see, this is what's so genius about it, is that God wants you to enjoy being a blessing. That God has made a way for you to be a blessing. And God has empowered you and he's given you that not only the opportunity, but he's calling you to it and says, listen, it's going to be all right. You see, I think about one day when we sit down at that great banquet with the Lord and it's going to be a great celebration. I don't, I don't think that it's going to come to us on paper plates. I don't think there's going to be plastic spoons or, or, or plastic, you know, tablecloths. Um, don't you kind of envision that celebration as completely over the top? Like, you know, it's not going to be a hamburger with a little ketchup packet that you rip open, right? As much as I love a good burger, I think it's going to be more extravagant than that. Sometimes we want to live extravagance on earth, and that's not what God is teaching. But he does, not, he does not want to withhold good things from you. He says, I know how to bless my children, and I will bless my children. But my children need to learn to be a blessing. My children need to learn that my priorities need to have true priority in their life. And when we do, it frees us from the preoccupation of that which we have or do not have. Our lives are dra dramatically transformed when we genuinely believe and begin to live and exercise incredible stewardship. It's not a boring word. It's really a pathway. It's a, it's a, a journey that takes us to a place. Now again, and I said it last week, I'll say it again today. The problem that we're absolutely concerned about is this. Most of us go, absolutely, I need to give to God. Absolutely. Very few people say, no, I shouldn't. But what I hear more often than not is this. Pastor Jeff, I just won't have enough. And this is what I hear number one all the time. I just won't have enough. And folks, when we, when we always give to God last, it always seems like we never have enough. But when we give to him first, and we say, okay, God, 
I am trusting you to make a way where there seems to be no way. That you're not just the Lord of my eternity, you're the Lord of my life today. And that means everything in my life. We looked at our body and our gifts and our spouse and our time. You are the Lord of all those things. Then why, why can't I treat you as you were the Lord of my finances as well? And we just need to, again, fix our lens to a different place, raise it higher, raise it to kingdom principles, and we will begin to see a very powerful outpouring of what God wants to do in your life today. How do I know it works? Because it just does. And um, as your pastor, I just believe that for all the challenges that you and I face here, certainly in regards to this community and its finances and the lack of jobs and everything else, I truly, genuinely believe without a shadow of a doubt that generosity will build that which needs to happen for the good in this community and that as we are faithful with little, he does much. And there's great need right here where we live. And as the body of Christ begins to live in generosity, then that which needs to get served and, and, and funded and everything else happens. I really do believe economic prosperity comes to this valley through this congregation. I believe that. I believe it. I don't even know how that works. But I believe it with all my heart. If you've got your connection, you'll see a few things I want to draw your attention to. Up here is your, your weekly memory verse. This is a good one. It's all about trust. And so Luke 16.10. I've also provided for you some extra reading. Uh, Luke chapter 16, you can read kind of the, that, that parable goes on elite, even a little bit further. Jesus gets in it into it with the Pharisees a little bit further so they understand better how manipulative they were really being. Uh, you can also look at the story of Cain and Abel. It's a, again, it's a very good picture of firsts and seconds. And then certainly, uh, and I hadn't thought about this until today, but the story of Joseph, all those storylines. Uh, but just the pictures there uh, of all the things that we face today, are, they are faced and they are, they, are, they are met with God's power in the life of Joseph. And you may want to consider some extra reading with Joseph. But here's your reflection question today. How could seeing stewardship, the right lens, stewardship as a privilege and opportunity, change your view of giving and generosity? How could seeing stewardship from the right lens, uh, how could seeing stewardship as a privilege and opportunity change your view of giving and generosity? We're going to... Um, we're going to uh, sing here in just a moment. But as we do that, I want to I pray over you. Because I know uh, anytime I talk about money, it's always a, it's a, for some it's an opportunity to be offended. And I come into these, these, these services all the time because it's never my desire to offend anyone. Um, and I know many go, oh, that's okay, Pastor. No, I understand that there's, there's a lot of hurt that comes along with this because you look at your situation and you go, man, I don't know God's blessing. I, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't live where you live, Jeff. So I just want to pray. Father God, I would pray that SJ would understand that you have a destiny for it far greater than where it is at this moment. But God, it will take absolute surrender of everything in our lives. It will mean we will give our children to the mission field. It means that we will give our lives to maybe a career redirection. It means, Lord, that we have to be open to your spirit speaking to us about what it is that we should be doing with the things that you've blessed us with. Lord, there are so many in this room today that 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 recognize that blessing, but sometimes forget that that blessing is also something that can be used as a blessing to another. And Lord, I, I, I know anytime we have a service like this or a series like this, people get a little bit wigged out. And the enemy comes in and goes, oh, you see, it's just about money. But Lord, I also know that we cannot serve both God and so I want to serve God, not in competition with money, 
But Lord, I want you to be the God of all my possessions and all my things. And take money out of the competition. Take money out of my worries. Take money out of my daily concerns. Take money out of the equation where I'm constantly wondering, how am I going to get by? And instead, live in the pleasure of knowing that when I have right priority with God, then He makes a way when there seems to be no other way. See, there's a pathway to maturity and growth as we begin to understand you in this powerful way. So Lord, wherever we are in this today, may our heart be open. May collectively our hearts be open to what the Holy Spirit would be prompting us to perhaps begin. Maybe some started the challenge last year and didn't finish. Said, I'm going to tithe for 90 days, but after a couple weeks, they, they got a little bit stressed. And so God, I pray that they would, they would begin again. And that they would understand that, that God, you, you own it all. So Lord, we thank you for your grace in this service today. Pray it in Jesus' name. Would you stand with us as we sing in conclusion today? God bless you. God is faithful, church. Amen. Let's celebrate him for how faithful he is, how good he is, how he provides, how he heals, how he restores. We love you, Jesus. At your name. shake and crumble at your name Jesus the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. We love you, God your name at your name the morning breaks in glory it's gonna get better church amen at your name Jesus creation sings your story at your name at your name your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord, yeah. Lord of all the earth, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name.
praise church. Hallelujah. We love you, God. Prayer friends, will you join us here at the front? We know, congregation, that you come each and every week with needs. And uh, our prayer friends are coming. I think they're coming. Sometimes they move slow. But they're coming because they want to have the opportunity to pray with you today. And we don't know what you, you're carrying, but uh, certainly the opportunity to be able to come alongside you and, and pray with you about whatever is going on is an honor for us. And uh, we count it as a privilege. Didn't preach a salvation message today. But I know that any time we are here together, that it's always an important thing to ask. If, if you've not made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've not invited him into your life, because you see, we've, we painted the picture that he's the owner of it all today. And so he's calling you to be good steward, and that begins with a relationship with Jesus, where you give your heart and your life to him. And so if this morning you're here and you're ready, you said, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to give my heart to Jesus then in just a moment, we're going to invite you to come down as well. God, we've prayed your prayer of blessing. May we be good stewards of everything in our path today. Everything. Everything. We pray this in Jesus' name. Folks, be out with us on Wednesday night. Prayer meeting on Thursday. would love to see the room filled as well. We're also tearing down this sanctuary here in about 15, 10, 15 minutes, getting ready for a banquet, all right? So we need to move all these chairs, all right? So if you can stay and help us for a few minutes, that would be fantastic. God bless you, folks. Thanks for being here today. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Because of